So this is a course in Conventory, and the one of the reasons to put them both in the same course is that they're polar opposites. <laughs> now they were uh, both they both both Conventory taught at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Venturi briefly worked for Kahn, but they were sort of at, mostly at odds. Now when we look at Kahn, I want to start by talking about the Beaux-Arts. Kahn had a Beaux-Arts education, and in a lot of ways, Beaux-Arts traditions influences architecture. So let's see what we mean when we say Beaux-Arts. So, first thing we mean is a building like that. What building is that? Correct. New York Public Library, 42nd Street is right here, and Fifth Avenue is in front of it. So, New York Public Library is in this Beaux-Arts tradition. And what makes it Beaux-Arts? Well, right off, in simplest terms, the use of Roman elements, which have their origins in Greece, and developed through the Renaissance of Baroque. So, what kind of column is this? Corinthian, right. So, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns, arches, domes, vaults. Uh, so all of these trim come from Roman architecture as then developed through the Renaissance and Baroque. Now, both, there's a lot of, this is more generally neoclassical architecture, meaning uh, architecture in the Roman style. And New York City City Hall is an example that it's not Beaux-Arts. So Beaux-Arts is a particular kind of neoclassical architecture. It takes place between the 1870s in Europe and the 1890s and 1920s in the United States. This is about 1905, Crer and Hastings, New York Public Library. So, definitions of Beaux-Arts. Beau is beautiful, art is art. So. This is French for beautiful art or fine arts. So at Pratt, there's the fine arts school. So painting sculpture is fine arts. For Beaux-Arts means fine arts. And it's several things. The Ecole des Beaux-Arts, School of Fine Arts, is a school of architecture, painting, and sculpture in Paris. Still there today, although its curriculum has changed. Uh, it can mean Beaux-Arts approach to architectural education practice at that school. Now, if you go back to the 1880s, 1890s, if you were going to be an architect, there were few, if any, architecture schools in the United States. So you would apprentice. And if you were really good, so you worked for a big firm. That big firm, after a couple of years, would spot you and say, you know what, you really have potential. Uh, we're going to send you for a year to Paris to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So most major American architects at the turn of the century uh, studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. An exception was Frank Lloyd Wright. When the leading Chicago architect spotted Wright, you know, started to be a real hot shot, and Daniel Burnham came to him and said, Frank, uh, we want to send you to Beaux-Arts for a year, two years, and then when you come back, you'll be an associate in our firm. And Wright said, I'm not interested in that stuff. I'm going to be doing modern architecture. So, but most of them did. Now, that form of education that they got, we'll talk about it in a minute, got adopted at the major schools, MIT, NYU, University of Pennsylvania. Those are sort of the, the dominant architecture schools in the early 1900s. So, NYU was the big architecture school in New York, and uh, it was closed during the 1930s due to the Depression. So we got a depression here. <laughs> We're not helping these students, giving them an architectural education if there's no building going on. So. The New York schools got together and said, some of us have to close, and NYU was one of them. <clears throat> and University of Pennsylvania, where Kahn studied. So this style of architecture is characterized by 
formal planning, things like symmetry, a strong part T. Part T is the underlying organizational diagram. Marche. Marche is the progress from the sidewalk through the entrance into the um, interior of the building. So think of the Metropolitan Museum. You got the sidewalks. Then you got those big steps. Then you got, you go between the columns. And then you got a double door. And then you got a foyer. And then you're in the lobby. Okay? Now let's go to the Museum of Modern Art. You go through the door, you're in the lobby. That's it. So, uh, modern architecture is not interested in this. Poche. Poche is the thickness of the walls. So you play the thickness of the wall against the space, and they become a pattern. Now we had that in part because we had thick walls. Modern architecture with modern materials don't need that anymore. Monumentality, historical style is usually classical. We just saw that Roman style. An integration of architecture, painting, sculpture, and crafts. So go to the New York Public Library, see the lions out front, sculptures, go inside their murals. And rationality, they think through how we're going to experience the building. So, first definition I gave you was uh, the school. So the Ecole des Beaux-Arts is the French National School of Fine Arts. Now, organized in the mid-1600s, this is a time when we get the emergence of a new thing, a nation state. So previously we had all these dukes, and they had land, and then there was a king who was sort of the informal coordinator of that. But these dukes or barons or noblemen were very powerful. They had the armies, they had the land, they had the money. In France, they start to change that and make a central national government and break the power of the lords. Now, if you're going to have a central nation, what do you need for a national identity? What do you need to be a nation? Capital. Say again? Capital. Capital, okay. What else do you need? Very first thing, it would be borders. Um, a common, what would be good? Laws. Language. We'll get, the, yeah, laws too. But, you know, okay, this is not obvious. You know, someone had to think this up. And so they create the Académie Française. And in France, there is an official organization that says what words are allowed into the language. So there's this cool place where everybody hung out in Paris called Le Drugstore. They had to take that sign down. <laughs> Drugstore is an American word. We're not, you're not allowed to use that word. The French are very nervous about losing their national identity because English is so globally powerful now that. Um, um, so, and you need uh, a common architectural style, a common art style. So they cr create the Académie Française for the language and the, um, uh, they called it both the Academy, the, 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 the Academy of Painting and Sculpture was created to create this style. And, uh, then it's merged with the Academy of Architecture, and that's the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, starting in 1793. What's the education like? Now, nifty thing about the Ecole des Beaux-Arts it was free and open to anybody under 30. That meant anybody. Men, women, from any country. You just had to pass the exam to get in. So you show up in Paris. If you went to a, a high school that had drawing, or your parents might have been architects, um, you take the exams and you're in. If not, you get an apartment, a garret tiny apartment, and the first thing you, you register as an aspirant, you aspire to get in, and you select a patron in an atelier. So imagine that the curriculum is like Pratt, except for one thing, no design studios. 
All the design studios are independent masters who have a loft near the school and you go and you register in their studio. And it's like 15 bucks a month or something like that. And they are now your master. And you will stay with them the whole time. You don't take a different studio every semester. You're in one studio. You train, you sit in on lectures, and finally you uh, pass the exam. Usually it takes two years. Uh, math, geometry, history, drawing, design. Now you're in, and you're a second class student. You go to lectures, which are optional. France is famous for that. You go to the Sorbonne, there's no attendance. You just, you're going to go to a lecture, you, can, you have to take the final exam. But it's optional when you go to the lectures. And the design is done through competitions. So here's how the competition works. You have to pass, let's say, six designs. And if you get very high marks, it's less. Here's how a design works. You hear that they're going to, the, the, there's going to be a library. That's all you know. It's a library. So you study up on libraries. You show up at 8 o'clock in the morning at the school. You go to the desk, and they give you the program. You've brought your drawing boards with you, paper and drawing boards and equipment. And you go into an 8-foot square cubicle. Lock the door. You're in there for eight hours. You make, you do the building. Now, you do a sketch design of the building. And you have to make two copies. One you turn in at 8 o'clock that evening. And the other one you take back with you to your studio. And that is, you now have six weeks to fully develop it. But your final design has to be cannot deviate from the basic principles of the sketch you turned in. So during the jury, they put up your final design and the sketch. And if you've deviated, you're disqualified. Now, you can now get all the help you want. First, you bring it back and the master says, oh shit, this is not going to work. I'll tell you what, in two weeks they've got another one. <laughs> to forget this. Uh, or he'll say, you know, I think there's something we can work with here. Let's get to work. You got six weeks. The older students are giving you crits. It's one of the advantages of studio. Uh, we mostly worked in studio at Penn, and you, you could always get crits from the older students. And you could understand the older students a lot, but you didn't know what the teachers were talking about. But the older students could explain it to you. And the younger students help to draw the trees in the presentations of the older students. So you get this whole team, you know. And now your project is due 12 o'clock midnight on Thursday. If you don't turn it in, fine, you didn't enter. You're there at 12 o'clock or forget it. There's no lights. So here you are. This card is called a charrette. That's where the word comes from. So you're bringing your drawings to the school from your studio, and you're running along there, still coloring in your trees <laughs> while you're running alongside the cart. It's like Pratt students still working on the subway you know, on, their, on their computers. Um, and then you have the jury. And so all these old farts who are like the power establishment are there to make sure that there, nothing innovative happens. Now, this is very tricky. When you chose that original studio, are you going to choose some old establishment guy who's buddies with all these guys? Or are you going to choose some hot shot young rebel? Here's the problem. You want to learn for the future, you choose the hot shot young rebel. But 
the culminating project, the thesis, is um, you keep doing these competitions until you finally do the culminating competition. It's called the Grand Prix de Rome. So that's thesis. They are, one project wins the prize as the best. You have to win if you want to be an important architect. That's bad enough. But some of the people you're competing against might have not won last year and they're entering again. So they're getting really good at this. If you win the Prix de Rome, you then spend one year in Rome or Athens at the school's villa and you do two things. You hang out and have a good time, and, but you study the original stuff. That you look at the real stuff that you were studying in school. There's the Parthenon right there. And you have to make a set of drawings. So I'll get that in a minute. So here is the lobby of the school. These sculptures are plaster casts of great historical sculpture, Greek and Renaissance. And uh, the art students will be sitting there with a pad in their lap, drawing from the original. Here's from Temple of Diana, a uh, giant Greek temple, um, a plaster cast model of it. So you can see, quote unquote, the real thing. Here's the jury. And your education consisted of basic principles. So there's a guy named Duran, one of the great teachers, and he's sort of developed these geometric systems of understanding space. We just looked at the Exeter Library by Louis Kahn. Here it is. Here it's being developed. So the sort of basic principles, think of the Villa Rotunda. So the basic ways in which you can organize space are studied. And then you make drawings. These are, this is one of um, four, three drawings from the Colosseum. So first floor of the Colosseum, the order is Doric or Tuscan. Second, uh, level the Colosseum, it's uh, Ionic, and the third level of Colosseum, it's Corinthian. So this is a student drawing, and these shadows are not, well, let's just sort of fake them. No, they're constructed. You make a, um, uh, a section, you draw a section, you then project the sun's rays onto your section. That tells you exactly where these shades and shadows are going to fall. So I still had that in school, culminating in a sphere casting a shadow on a sphere. <laughs> that was hard. And here are two pre de Rome winners. Uh, this one is a, a palace for a monarch. And I, I, I mentioned um, Poche. We see that here, where the thickness of the walls create these spaces. There's a lot of staircases in here. Um, and now this is a later one, really simple and clear. This is Via Le Le Duc. It's an important pioneer of modernism with this very strong, modern, clean, simple, geometric building. It was so powerful at one. The pre -Rome. So when you win, the first thing you have to do is paint a portrait of yourself, which of course you can do. Like all of you are pretty good at photography, right? Okay, they didn't have photography, so they were pretty good at painting. And, you know, sketching, they would go to a building, they could make sketches of it. And so you go up to the top floor of the call, and all the portraits are there. They're about two feet square uh, of the winners. 
and you go off to, he chose Athens, and you make a set of drawings, plans, sections, elevations, of a monument, in this case the Parthenon, of the way it is now in ruins, and restore it to the way it originally was. And since you have a strong archaeological background, you've studied this historical architecture in school, you have the ability to do that. And you do uh, elevation and details. These are then used in the teaching in the school. They didn't have photography and slides. So they would have these big books, and the history teacher would be turning the pages of the book, showing the class the drawings, and that's what we have here using your drawings. So the most famous building built out of this true tradition is the Paris Opera. And uh, Peter Owen Winter and a, a major figure at the Ecole Beaux-Arts was Charles Garnier. And he won the competition to design the new Paris Opera, which is now called Palais Garnier. Garnier Palace. And we see these historical revival styles. These ornate interiors, famous staircase. So it's very ornate, but also this rich play, form, and space, the way the stairs curve it. The theater itself. And we see that um, the buildings that these people were doing were not just, oh, let's imitate a Roman bath. There's a lot going on here. The stair I showed you is right here. A tiny part of the building. The theater I showed you is right here. Stage, the balconies. Tiny part of the building. There's a huge amount of stuff going on here. These are the flies so that, you know, when the curtain opens, you see a past castle or a forest or whatever, and uh, next scene they pull this up and drop this one down. So this is to make the thing work, the huge hydraulic uh, machines here to move this up and down. There are giant workshops where they make the sets. So this is a, a real operation. Here we are in plan. We see the marche, the stairs, entrance, Double doors, vestibule, main lobby with the stair. And this is the theater, quite small compared to all the other stuff we need to make it work. So here's what's involved. Now, um, we get the Chicago School in Architecture. And let me um, see if I have that on here. I've been moving my computers around, so I might not have last semester. Hmm. No. Okay. Uh, we get the Chicago School. We we have the pioneering um, skyscrapers done by, among others, Louis Sullivan, for whom Franklin Wright wrote. And these begin in the 1870s, 1880s, and Chicago sees itself as the real heart of American architecture. They say, those architects in New York, they're just a, a, a branch colony of Europe. 
They're too close to Europe. We in the American heartland in Chicago are able to do, uh, invent a new architecture responsive to the new industrial materials, steel, elevators, electricity, and bring about these high-rise uh, pioneering skyscrapers. 1893, there's gonna be a big world's fair, and <clears throat> Daniel Burnham is put in charge. Daniel Burnham decides that the style will be this Beaux-Arts style. The other Chicago architects are furious. They've been sold out. There's New York architects coming in doing this stuff. So this brings that architecture to the United States. And it's been here, but this really launches a big time. So the style that I've been talking about becomes the style of architecture of Columbia University, Metropolitan Museum, 42nd Street Library, Grand Central Station, Washington Square Arch, Brooklyn Museum. So these are all built in about a 10-year period in this Beaux-Arts style right at the time when modern architecture is getting started. So there's a big fuss about this. The modern architects and people who are culturally modern are furious. They've been sold out. What the hell is this? My parents were sort of avant-garde, artistically oriented people in FDR's new Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, living in Washington. In 1941, they do the um, National Gallery in this Beaux-Arts style. 1941, that's two years after Frank Lloyd Wright does Falling Water. <laughs> it's like 40 years after Frank Lloyd Wright launches the Prairie style. It, it's like, whoa. So there's this big conflict between the Beaux-Arts and modern architecture. But this is pretty exciting. Three quarters of a million people came to opening uh, night, and it's one of the first times people saw electric lights. The whole thing was lit up at night with electric lights. This new thing. Um, this is the woman's building by Sophia uh, Hayden, first uh, woman to graduate MIT. And so this now spreads all over. This is the old Pennsylvania Station, now replaced by Madison Square Gardens. And here's the post office, still there. Here's the train station, which was torn down. Uh, and everybody's really upset about it now. Reminiscent of a Roman bath or a basilica. And this is the uh, main interior room. Again, uh, principles of a Roman bath, adopted from the Baths of Caracalla. So here's the Baths of Caracalla. Here's Penn Station, pretty close. Then the, when you go down to the trains, stairs down to the trains is this crystal palace, this iron and glass structure. The whole thing is really amazing. Torn down around 1960. But here it is under construction. It's a steel building. So all this is to use an unfriendly word, fake. These are hollow and there are steel columns in there. But it's not telling us that. So modern architects are very put off by this. And this is not Roman concrete vaulting it's plaster hanging from the steel ceiling.
Here's the, this, uh, this photograph was taken during, it's being torn down, and we see the steel beams, and so the steel columns inside these stone columns. Is Grand Central that way too? Yeah, Grand Central is a modern steel building. Grand Central has, let's count them, two subways, a major railroad, a roadway going through it, and there's 11 skyscrapers sitting on it. So Grand Central is not, oh, let's make this little Roman bath and put it on the sidewalk. It goes down a half a dozen levels. This is a modern mega machine. This roadway goes through it. There's a sub 42nd Street subway, Lexington Avenue subway, which has to jog over. Here's the Metro North Railroad. And all the red here is banks of elevators from 11 skyscrapers sitting on top of this thing. So it's this huge megalithic construction. Uh, even though it's looking like, oh, isn't it made this cute little woman bath? Uh, nice space, but there's a lot more going on here. Oh, and the tracks are double layered. Uh, the, the, uh, the, in other words, is here's all the gates, but then underneath there's a whole other set of uh, gates. Forty Second Street Library. Look at that. With our integration of sculpture. Now, one more example of Beaux Arts architecture. Rockefeller Center, done by a large team of architects. So I'll put the name in the wall. But um, Raymond Hood was sort of the chief design architect, and Wallace K. Harrison was sort of the chief political coordinator of the project. And we look at this, and there's no ornament. There's sculpture, but the walls are clean uh, limestone. But we look at this rendering of it. This is a, all these architects studied that they called the Beaux-Arts. This is a Beaux-Arts vision, just without the ornament and high rise. This tradition gets to the United States, and we would have competitions. We um, sometimes still enter competitions these days. And so the Beaux-Arts Institute would announce a competition. We're going to do a railroad station. So somebody at uh, Pratt or NYU or Penn would say, yeah, okay, we'll do that in my studio. So, okay, this is a studio. We're all going to do this railroad station. And we get copies of the program. We all get to work. And then if you want to, at the end of the studio, you can submit your drawings to the uh, Beaux-Arts Institute of Design in New York. And you get a number on your drawing, your name's in an envelope on the back. So there won't, you know, presumably these will be judged fairly. And if you win, you win the Peter Rome or the Paris Prize or the Rome Prize or, and you get a year in Rome scholarship. The, in the 1920s, the 19 teens and 20s, the best school of architecture in the United States was University of Pennsylvania, which you can say objectively because it won the most prizes. In this, uh, and Louis Kahn was a student there, and his teacher was Paul Philippe Cray. So Paul Philippe Cray was a Beaux Arts architect who came through from this entire tradition who relocated the United States, did some wonderful buildings. He did the um, campus, the University of Texas, Austin. Is that where you went? Somebody said they went to Texas, right? No, I live in Texas. You live in Texas. 
Um, he did the campus, University of Texas, Austin. He did the Pan Am Building in Washington, D.C., which is right near the um, Ben Al Memorial, and some other interesting projects. This would be what a student drawing might look like. So this student has very economically put together section, plan, and elevation in one drawing. So it's a handsome comp composition as a drawing. So these are what Khan's drawings would have looked like as a student. We have some. And this is a proposed memorial in Washington, D.C. to celebrate Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic. So this student has put a map showing Europe and the United States and the route of the flight. And then it's taken responsibility for the landscape. So this is what a, a design competition drawing would tend to look like. And uh, this is all done in pen and ink. Now, uh, we, now we're in 1932, uh, we've got 1929 to 31 would be the Kirby City's Full of Savoie, 1936 is Frank Lloyd's Falling Water, uh, 1909 is Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House. So we're, we're in the midst of modern architecture, and this Beaux-Arts stuff is like, what is that? And so here, Paul Philippe Cray does a building that's called Strip Classicism. So we've got kind of the design formal principles of this Beaux-Arts architecture, but we no longer have columns. These are, has no base, no top. It's got fluting, but it's just a <clears throat> abstract form. Large, unornamented white surfaces. So it's an attempt to respond to modern architecture. It doesn't work. People don't buy it. And <clears throat> this fades away. Louis Kahn was, uh, worked on this project. So Cray was his teacher. And then Kahn uh, works for Cray for a while. Anybody know any strip classical buildings? Perhaps in Brooklyn. Perhaps not too far from here. How many people have been to the Brooklyn Public Library? Anybody? So here we've got, um, it's kind of classical, symmetrical, but these are cylinders, they're not columns. There's no base, there's no capital, there's no antastases, which would be, uh, you know, kind of a curved outline, but it's just zip, 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 kind of very boxy. So, um, it's 1932, 1941, John Russell Pope does the National Gallery, and it's the last major neoclassical building. But we're going to find that there are principles Khan's not going to revive these um, dark ionic and Corinthian columns, but he's going to revive kind of the underlying principles of the Beaux Arts. We're going to see how he does that. So here's the plan of this building. It's sort of an H, sort of a pantheon with two wings. Here's our marche. Steps, vestibule, lobby, and then circulation to the galleries. And we see that there are five parts to these buildings. So now, rather than just talking about the style, the domes, vaults, the arches, dark iron, curtain, curtain columns, all of these buildings share the same basic organizational principles. Entrance, stair, door, vestibule. Great space, the dome. Stairs, not such a big deal in this building. Hall, 
So instead of corridors, we have halls, great halls for circulation. And then large, medium, and small spaces. So look at these five elements. Now, so here's our entrance, our great space, our halls for circulation, and our large, medium, and small spaces. And then when our feet get tired at the end of the several hours of running the museum, we get a little garden here. I'm going to find this is the exact organization of Louis Kahn's Yale British Studies Museum. <laughs>